this presentation is a bit different from the other talks that you may have attended to so far here. Um, because basically it's a comparison between computer viruses and biological viruses. So that means we will have to dwell into some biological concepts, which means that we won't be talking only about computers for a change. And we do hope that you will enjoy it as much as we enjoyed it when we did the research. I wrote this paper and did that research with Axel, but unfortunately she couldn't be here today. So I will be assisted by Roshna here on her step. You guys can see, can see her this time. Uh, the paper was reviewed by Ms. Yadava, who is a PhD student in immunology. So basically she made sure that we would not say too much bull crap in the paper. And we all part of the 40 yard, 40 net 40 yard team, except for Ms. Yadava, of course, uh, which basically 40 yard team is the threat research and response team at 40 net. So the reason behind all that, as I said, we, when we started, we wanted to do a comparison for fun and to please the curious minds, because, I mean, like, hackers have curious minds. And basically, we, we really enjoyed it. But along the way, we figured out that uh, it could uh, help us to understand, get a better understanding of why the immune system in the body was so much better than the AV systems in computers in terms of virus detection. Because granted, some people die because they are infected by viruses, but they never go undetected. They might win over the immune system, but they never go undetected. And we will see exactly why, and we will see why it's so much uh, different from the AV systems, where kind of computer viruses get stay undetected on computers for months or years. And eventually, along the course of our research, we came to wonder if at some point there could be some kind of convergence between biological viruses and computer viruses. That means computer viruses starting to behave more like biological viruses and biological viruses starting to behave more like computer viruses. And possibly one crossing the frontier to the other realm and vice versa. Which may sound foolish at first or may sound like a bad scenario for a whole bad Hollywood movie, but uh, you will see afterwards, it's not, not so stupid a question, actually. So this is how we will proceed. First, we'll go through a background in biology, which is necessary, not, not too deep, not too deep, fortunately. Then we'll compare uh, the attack strategy and strategies and defense strategies of biological and computer viruses, and we'll see that there's a lot of similar, similarities. And then, as I said, the scary stuff for Hollywood will be in the last part with convergence scenarios. So biologically speaking, what, 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 what is a virus? Essentially, it is a strand of DNA or RNA surrounded by a capsid. A capsid is, a, is a, an envelope of proteins. Those DNA strands code for the, mole the molecules and the proteins that form the capsid. What is very interesting about viruses is that they are really at the frontier, at the border between the living and the non-living. We don't really know if it's a form of life or not. It depends on your definition of a form of life. Now, most scientists will tell you the smallest form of life is a bacteria because it is one cell. And all the living organisms are made of cells. So the, the smallest possible living being should be one cell, one bacteria. A virus is not a bacteria because it doesn't have a metabolism on its own. To exploit, to decode the information in, in its DNA, it cannot rely on its own metabolism. It must infect the host, a, a cell, and it's a cell that will produce that will interpret its DNA sequences. So it has genetic material like all the living beings, but it doesn't have a metabolism. It's not a cell like all living beings, so it's really in the middle. So here it is. Since it doesn't have a metabolism of its own, it must attach 
to a cell to replicate. Once it's attached to a cell, it injects its genetic material into the cell. In most cases, you'll have then a lytic cycle when uh, the, the, the genetic material is injected into the cell and the cell metabolism start to read the DNA sequence and produce the proteins uh, that the DNA sequence code for. And those proteins will create new viruses. And when there are enough new viruses in the, in the cell, the cell cannot contain them anymore, and it just bursts. And all the new viruses get loose and will go infect other cells. But sometimes also you have the lysogenic cycle where the, 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 um, the genetic material is inserted inside the DNA of the cell. And so when the cell replicates, which is a mitosis operation, um, it gets conserved along the way. And at some point, it will be interpreted like this, and we will fall back to that scenario. <clears throat> now, what do we have in our bodies to fight against viruses? Basically, the immune system is divided in two different subsystems. You have the innate subsystem, which is the non-specific and generic response which is made of the complement system, phagocytes, and cells. We will go over all that in the next slides. And the adaptive system is the specific response. It implements some memory mechanisms, and it's made of helper T cells, killer T cells, and B cells. We will go over those, those also. So the complement system is perhaps the most complex system, not, 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 not possibly the, the most interesting. It's made of a, a large combinations of proteins flowing into the, into the veins, in the blood flow. Blood flow. Uh, it, it will, those proteins will mark the intruders, viruses or bacteria, by binding to their surface because of some special complementarity. Uh, that will attract macrophages, which are part of the innate sub subsystem also. Also, they will try to clump and group intruders. And sometimes those proteins making the complement system will also chemically attack the intruders. So all, all those stuff uh, have some scientific, scientific names, so disease optimization, chemotaxis, uh, membrane attack complex, and clump clumping. More interesting, perhaps, are the phagocytes. Phagocytes are granulocytes on the top left corner, uh, macrophages here, and dendritic cells. Basically, they eat viruses by uh, uh, binding to them. Now, how do they bind to the viruses and then eat them up? They have on their surface um, some receptors that are going to match uh, some proteins or some characteristics on the surface, surface of viruses and bacteria, generically, meaning they can bind to any virus. Uh, now, uh, you would think that it's strange that, that since viruses and bacteria are, are, are supposed to evolve along the, uh, along the Darwinian rules of evolution, which is to say uh, uh, mutation, and selection of mutations that are, that, that are not deleterious to, 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 the, to the organism. So you would think that the, those characteristics that the macrophages use to bind to the viruses would be eliminated by evolution. And it's not the case because those characteristics are critical, so critical that even though they are deleterious and detrimental to the, to the, to the virus or the bacteria, they are still conserved. So this is what they call evolutionary concern characteristics. Okay, so the macrophages, phagocytes, bind to the viruses because of critical characteristics that cannot be eliminated, and then they digest them inside, inside them by chemical reactions. This is a bit like a heuristic engine, if you want to compare to the computer world because it's very generic. It matches all, all different viruses, and it relies on characteristics of viruses. For example, a heuristic engine in, in the AV world will be 
uh, you have one, one heuristic flag for uh, this stuff replicate, this stuff uh, makes use of this or this API, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Critical characteristic that, that versus can't really uh, uh, um, uh, not use. Um, also, the phagocytes release cytokines, um, which are some proteins uh, used in communication between cells to help NK cells. NK cells, NK cells are na natural killer cells. They are part of the innate subsystem also, meaning they are generic also. And they're kind of interesting because they will bind to, um, to viruses and intruders and then kill them with, by releasing some chemicals. But the way they do, the way they recognize the viruses is they, they basically use whitelisting. They recognize everything that is non-self. Because all the cells of your body um, have on their surface a specific antigen, which is called HLA for human leukocyte antigen, which is specific to you and you only. So those NK cells, they recognize when a cell doesn't have your own marker on its surface. It's basic whitelisting if you want to translate it into the AV world. Now for the adaptive subsystem, um, which is made of uh, helper T cells, killer T cells, and B cells. The macrophages, part of the innate subsystem, when they eat up the viruses, like, like I explained earlier, and digest them with some chemical reactions, some little pieces of the virus uh, uh, remain, and they are going to be presented at the surface of the macrophage in the form of antigens. It's a bit like saying, hey guys, I just, I just, I just got that virus, I, I, I ate that virus, and, and then this is, this is some bits of the virus. Do you recognize it? Some helper T cells bind to the macrophage, recognize the antigens, and activate the adaptive subsystem. What is important to understand in the adaptive subsystems is that each T cell, should it be helper T cell, cure T cell, and the B cells, each one of those are specific to one virus only. For example, flu type A, will, some, some, some cells will be specifically dedicated to that virus, and flu type B will be, another, will be other cells, B cells and T cells. Um, this is because the T cells and B cells have on their surface a specific receptor that only match the shape of one virus. So killer T cells and B cells eliminate the viruses after being activated by the helper T cells. Basically, the killer T cells um, as I said, bind to the virus because of the specific receptor, and then release some chemicals and kill it. They pretty much function like blacklisting in the AV world. They are, they are basically AV signatures, if you want to translate into the AV world. That each signature, each pattern is dedicated to a certain virus. You can eliminate that, that, that virus this way. Now for B cells, those are the ones who, uh, they're also dedicated to one virus only. When, when they bind to it, they will release antibodies. Antibodies are dedicated to one virus only also. And the antibodies will bind to the virus surf surface. And they make it easy for phagocytes, macrophages, to spot the viruses. So I would say you may compare the, compare the B cells to uh, an packer in the AV world, because you know, it's straight off, it, it makes it easier for the generic system to spot the viruses. For example, um, when you have a packed uh, computer virus, all its characteristics are hidden, and there are some layers of obfuscation, right? So your heuristic engines will not see much. It will only see, this is packed, we will not see what API it uses, we will not see if it replicates or whatever, right? 
So you need to first unpack the virus and then the generic subsystem becomes more efficient with your heuristic engines and so on. Um, yeah, as I said earlier, um, the adaptive subsystem implements some memory mechanism. So the T cells and B cells, uh, after when, when, when they are activated by helper T cells, they multiply to fight the virus. And when the infection is, is finished, some of the cells will remain as memory cells. So that if the same virus comes in again, they can multiply very fast and react faster. So I will, I will let Roshna uh, keep on with that. Okay, so now that you've had your biology lesson, let's look at some of the, the attack strategies that are common between the biological world and the computer world, or what I like to call God versus man. So one thing we see in common is uh, something called outnumbering defenses. So what the, what the HIV virus does is it, incre it replicates itself to a number that is so high that it renders the, the defense system of the human body helpless. Uh, this can sort of be compared to a denial of service attack in the computer virus world where uh, you overload one resource so much that it fails to function. So for example, if I send too many requests to a server, it, it won't be able to process after a while and it loses its basic functionality. Uh, one basic difference between the biological world and the computer world would be that uh, uh, human viruses, they try to overload one host with a lot of, uh, by massively infecting it. Now, this was interesting uh, at, at the beginning of computer viruses when just infecting uh, someone's machine was exciting enough. Uh, whereas now, uh, the purpose for computer viruses is monetary gains. So the idea is to pro propagate to more and more victims to get higher gains. So this uh, practice is used in a lot of uh, the new worms and botnets. For example, the Conficker worm, it managed to infect six and a half million hosts in a short period of four days. Okay, so uh, another thing we can uh, see in common between uh, human viruses and computer viruses is uh, there can be instances where the victim actually happens to contact the virus by himself and manages to get himself infected. For example, if you uh, go to visit a doctor and you find yourself uh, in the waiting room, so even though you might not be ill, you are exposing yourself to the danger of uh, getting the flu. So this is somewhat similar to what we see in the computer world in the form of drive-by downloads uh, and phishing, in, in which case the the, the user manages to get himself infected consciously or unconsciously. Uh, for example, uh, a lot of the new uh, mobile viruses uh, are found just sitting on highly visited websites. So you visit it and you unknowingly uh, infect your phone. A lot of the new uh, Android viruses come packaged with legitimate applications. So you think you are uh, installing a le uh, an innocent application like uh, a, a photo displayer or something, but actually what happens is it comes packaged with another virus, so you, you actually went to the virus and got yourself infected. Okay, um, another thing we can see in common is something called polymorphism. So polymorphism is basically the phenomenon of replicating uh, a virus, by, but uh, making certain changes every time it's replicated. So this wasn't actually uh, invented by computer attackers. It, it's already uh, a phenomenon we see in the human, uh, in the world of human biology, where uh, you have something called error checking proteins. So every time a, a human virus cell replicates, uh, the body makes sure it's not too different from the original form. But what influenza does is it directly attacks these error checking proteins. So basically that means every time the cell is replicated, it's a new form of the virus. And so every time, you are, every time it replicates, it's forming a new mutant of itself, which is something we've seen in viruses like coop face and sality. Uh, the basic difference in polymorphism between uh, the computer world and uh, 
the biological world is that biological viruses, when they mutate, they change uh, the basic functionality of the virus. It's possible to change the basic fun functionality, whereas uh, in the case of computer viruses, you're only changing the form of the virus. You're not changing the functionality of it because changing the functionality would uh, require writing new lines of code, whereas all you're doing is changing the package in which, in which it comes. Okay, so uh, another thing we saw is something called virus mixing. So for example, if you happen to have uh, one a particular variety of the flu called flu A, and you get really unlucky and you uh, manage to get yourself infected, infected by another strand of the flu, this could result in the creation of a hybrid uh, variety of the flu called flu C. So basically, uh, you, uh, you get infected by two separate varieties, but in the end, it, it, creates, it manages to create a hybrid. This is something that we can also see in computers. So for example, if you have a computer that's infected by a mass mailer called MyDoom, uh, what a mass mailer does is it sends out emails to, uh, it sends a copy of itself to all the contacts present on your computer. And if you also happen to get infected by a file infector, which basically, um, uh, corrupts all the files present on your drive. So what actually happens is it also infects then the copy of this mass mailer which is present on your drive. So when the mass mailer does mail itself to all your contacts, it's actually mailing a, a hybrid variety of it, which is the mass mailer infected by a file infector. Okay, so something really smart uh, that was uh, that you can see in the human uh, in human viruses is that uh, instead of trying to uh, penetrate the defenses of the body, some viruses actually directly attack the defense. So uh, this, this can be seen in uh, viruses like HIV and flavivirus. What it does is it's, uh, it's attacking your defense system, so you have nothing to protect yourself from these viruses. Uh, something similar can be seen in viruses like Salati, where uh, it terminates all the antiviruses running on your PC. So uh, again, you are exposed. And uh, what it also does is it adds itself to the uh, authorized applications on your, uh, uh, on your machine. So it's basically granting you uh, elevated privileges. Uh, and basically, then you are defenseless to the virus. OK, uh, so in the world of human virology, you see there are some viruses that attack specific parts or specific components of the system. So you have the rotavirus, which attacks the small intestine, or poliovirus, which attacks motor neurons. Similarly, in the computer world, we have viruses that attack a particular component of the system. So there are viruses that attack uh, particular applications, like FileZilla or Internet Explorer, or a virus that attacks the Windows protected service storage. Uh, a very good example of this is the Eki virus for iPhone. So what it would do is it would uh, check, uh, it would attack jailbroken iPhones and it would verify if the password on the phone is the default, is actually the default password. And if it is a match, then basically uh, your phone is completely in control of the attacker. Okay. Now, uh, another phenomenon that's in common is something called incubation. Uh, incubation is uh, the time period between uh, the point where you get infected by a virus and the point where the, system, the symptoms of the virus become evident. So for example, you might have the flu, but it takes about two, three days for the, systems to be, uh, for the symptoms to be apparent and for you to know that you have the flu. Uh, the same uh, strategy is used in some viruses which are called time bombs. So they're basically designed to go off at a particular uh, point of time. For example, the Michelangelo virus in 1991. It was designed to go off on the birthday of Michelangelo. Then you have the code red virus uh, which uh, only uh, spreads itself from the 1st to 19th of each month and is dormant for the rest of the month. So uh, this is again another idea we, uh, which, which has been taken from the biological world. Now, uh, how these viruses ensure that the system stays infected is, sort of, is also uh, similar between the two worlds. For example, what the HIV uh, virus does is it uh, infects the memory T cells. As Guillaume explained before, uh, memory cells uh, basically help your body cope better 
every time you're attacked by a virus. So uh, if you're attacked, uh, attacked by a particular virus uh, at one point of time, the memory T cell will register that. And so basically it helps you cope with the same virus better the next time you are infected with it again. What HIV does is it directly attacks the, these cells. So basically that means your body will have no memory of being attack, attacked by this cell, making sure that these cells are present in your body even years after treatment. Uh, this is somewhat similar to uh, what we saw in a root kit called TDL4 last year. Uh, which would actually infect directly the master boot record on a machine. So uh, basically that meant your uh, machine would stay infected even if you reinstall the OS on your machine. Uh, the ZS botnet also makes sure uh, machines stay infected by sending frequent updates, uh, making sure uh, you, uh, all of its bots have the latest version of the virus, etc. Okay. So uh, until now, uh, basically we've seen that for the most part of it, God won. Uh, the computer attackers didn't really come up with very brilliant ideas. They're ideas that are mostly already seen in human virology. However, the, the one area where we did manage to beat God, where the attackers did manage to beat God was called, uh, is something called anti-debugging tricks. So what this is, is the attackers anticipate uh, how the, the virus might be analyzed or detected uh, by an antivirus company and they uh, put in measures to prevent this or to make this process more difficult. Uh, some of the means of doing this is something called URL redirection. So you had uh, this virus called DNS changer which, which would, uh, it, for example, if an infected machine would try and connect to an AV website, you would automatically be redirected to another website, which basically prevents you from knowing your machine is infected at all. Uh, other techniques are uh, detection of uh, some tools such as reverse engineering tools, debuggers, or uh, virtual machines, which ma basically makes the job of AV analysts more difficult. Because uh, if, if, I, if I'm trying to run a sample of the virus and if the virus knows uh, what to look for, or the kind of tools I use and uh, what to look for, it might not run or it can hide itself from these tools, making analysis more difficult. Now, the reason uh, this is possible in uh, computer viruses and not uh, in, uh, fortunately not possible in the uh, biological world is because uh, computer viruses are the code for computer viruses is a lot more complex. It's much bigger in size uh, as compared to uh, biological viruses. For example, the, uh, if we consider the code for uh, the common flu, it's uh, barely about 22 kilobytes, which is merely a fraction of most of the viruses we see. Okay, back to you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the defense mechanisms, uh, we've been over some of those already. Basically, detecting virus, viruses inside the body makes use of heuristics. We saw that they were akin to phag phagocytes. White listing, akin to NK cells. And black listing, akin to T and B cells plus antibodies. However, there is a catch in black listing. And this is the key difference between the AV world and the immunology world. The key is that biological viruses are a finite set. There is a limited number of possible biological viruses. It's 10 to 16. At any time in your body, you have 10 to 8 different T cells and B cells with their specific receptor matching one virus only. But when some of these died, others are generated with different receptors. So over the course of a few weeks, all the 10 power 16 possibilities have been all covered. And this is why biological viruses are seldom not detected. It would, be, it would be like in the AV world if you add, uh, if, if the number of possible viruses 
was finite, and then you, all, you, all you'd need to have would be uh, 10 power 16, a 10 power 16 big database of updates. Or possibly 10 power 8, and then you get circular, circular updates so that over the course of a few weeks, you check all the 10 power 16 possibilities. Unfortunately, it's not the case. There is an infi in infinite number of possible combinator viruses. And this is why sometimes they go through the AV defenses. We fall back to Cohen's theorem, right? Which is a, given an unknown piece of code, the question is it a virus or not is not mathematically decidable. So the, strategy, the defense strategy of the, of the body is usually to kill everything, intruders, but also infected cells, which present the antigens of the intruders. But it would be like, in a computer world, it would be like if you, if you would just kill all the infected computers or reinstall all infected computers, which unfortunately we cannot afford to do also. And then finally, you get, you get vaccines, which are a bit like, um, like AV updates, because you present some sample of, of, of viruses so that, so that the, the, immune, the, immunology, the immune system builds up defenses ahead of time. So basically, you, you load the adaptive system with signatures, much like the AV update. So, what, we, what we've just covered um, is basically a comparison between biological and camera versus, but under the angle of functionality. We compare the functionalities, how they attack, how the body defends, etc., etc. Now, beyond this, we may want to uh, uh, wonder and, and, and and get, get one step beyond and wonder what's the essence of the virus? What's its purpose? And is it possible that sometimes uh, the border gets crossed from one way or another? As I said earlier, a biological virus is essentially a DNA strand. Now a DNA strand is a sequence of nucleotides, A, G, C, and T. Those sequences code for proteins that are built based on these sequences inside the infected cell. So in the end, that DNA strand is information coded in base 4 with the nucleotides. That information codes for proteins, and proteins in turn uh, uh, um, make up for the behavior of the virus, because it's the spe spatial characteristics of the virus that make up its behavior. So in the end, you get info coding for a behavior. For computer viruses, it is code in base 2, 0 and 1, right? And this code, when interpreted by the infected host comp uh, CPU, uh, defines the behavior of the virus. So in the end, both types of viruses are information coding for parasitic and replicative behavior. In base 4 or base 2, but in the end it's the same. So in a sense, biological and computer viruses are the same. Now what's their purpose? Well, the key when we deal with computer viruses is that they are designed by conscious intelligence, which defines the purpose. Could be making money, doing some espionage, uh, like the GhostNet case, political espionage, or uh, um, um, intellectual, intellectual property theft, or sometimes even destruction of a strategic, um, strategic objective, like the Stuxnet one, for example. Uh, on the other hand, biological viruses don't really have a purpose in the sense that they are the fruit of random mutations playing along the lines of Darwinian evolution. So, unless you believe in intelligent design, biological viruses don't have really a purpose. 
But then the same could be said of us. Because we are also the fruit of random mutations, right? So would it be possible that at some point uh, we, we witness exactly the opposite, which means biological viruses being designed by a conscious intelligence and computer viruses uh, uh, being Darwinian, playing along the lines of Darwinian evolution. Well, as a matter of fact, um, when dealing with design biological viruses, well, the pop culture is full of references to that. You have a number of uh, conspiracy theories that say that AIDS was man-made, which is completely uh, 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 crazy. SARS also is supposed to be man-made, and this is backed up by a couple of scientists, actually. If, if you're interested in that matter, I, I encourage you to uh, um, read the Wikipedia entry about that. Uh, in science fiction, you get a St. Mary virus. Yeah? No one? No? Yeah, we, we are in a hacker conference or what? No one knows the St. Mary virus? It is the virus um, uh, used in the, in the book and then in the movie V for Vendetta by the, by the oppressive regime to control the population. And then they, 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 they come out as saviors with the vaccines, et cetera, et cetera, science. Um, actually, the technology to produce viruses, synthetic viruses, exists. In 2002, a group of scientists created out of nothing the polio virus. And later in 2008, the SARS virus was created out of nothing, synthesized. So theoretically, it could be used, it could be designed as biological weapons. We have the technology for that. Um, this hasn't happened so far, to our knowledge. Because for two reasons. First, uh, biological weapons are banned under the uh, bio Biological uh, Warfare Convention. And the militaries think that it's not a very good weapon in the sense that you cannot really control the evolution of it. And it could backfire at the attacking army. So they, they'd rather use bacteria like anthrax, which is, which is more easy to control. But of course, that doesn't mean that at some point some bioterrorists, some terrorists will uh, uh, design a virus to, uh, uh, to spread fear. It's possible. Te technically, it's not so difficult. And yeah, this is scary, but it's the point of terrorism <laughs> to be scary. On the other end, um, Darwinian communal viruses have been created already as a proof of concept by some, some researchers. They call this evolvable malware, and unsurprisingly, they make use, if you use of genetic algorithms. Uh, but, okay, so they played along the rules of replication, mutation, selection, like any living being but they carry the significant dose of intelligent design to begin with. I mean, they were designed like this by a conscious intelligence. So it's not really what we're looking for. What we're looking for would be like a spontaneous virus evolving out of nothing. Uh, in the pop culture, you have this masterpiece called Ghost in the Shell, where uh, that, 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 that takes place in the future. And the, the, the flow of digital data is so dense throughout the world that it gives rise, gives birth to a sentient form of life spontaneously. This is at the heart of the plot of Ghost in the Shell. Now, without going that far, as far as a sentient form of life, conscious form of life, could it be possible that a virus evolved out of all the data flowing, digital data flowing through all the wires in the world today? Well, fact is, according to Dr. Cohen, the smallest possible virus would be eight characters long. Aside of that, you have 15 petabytes of new info created daily. Among those petabytes of info, probably at some place, or maybe at several different places, 
you will find those eight characters, consecutive characters, accidentally. Probability is obviously not new. Now, because those characters exist accidentally, doesn't mean that the vir virus will, will, will uh, take life. You need a CPU to execute those eight characters. Now, you guys are security researchers. And you know that software is vulnerable, death bugs. And all this data generated daily at some point is processed by software. Takes, takes it as an input. And some in software sometimes when presented when with unexpected inputs will just crash and direct the execution flow to an arbitrary location in memory. It's the basis of stack overflow, et cetera, et cetera. So what if that flow of execution get redirected accidentally in the memory right somewhere in those eight cars? Then you get the virus spontaneously uh, 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 being born. So the probability of this happening uh, is, I think, not new. Because as I said, there's so, 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 much, so much information flowing, so much so vulnerable software also, that accidentally it could happen. It would be very interesting to compute, to give an evaluation of that probability, which is out of the scope of that paper, but it would make for an interesting uh, research. OK, so we, we've just seen that computer and biological viruses share the same sense. Essentially, they are the same inside. Although, so th there are information coding for replicative and uh, par uh, parasitic behavior. But this info is material materialized dif differently. In biological viruses, it's materialized by, by, by molecules. In computer viruses, it's by electro, electromagnetic properties, right, at some point. So the question sounds foolish. Can one virus cross to the other realm and vice versa? Because they are not, not in the same realm, mat material realm. If the frontier cannot be crossed, at least it can be blurred. Today, people have inside their bodies pacemakers, ear implants, deep brain stimulators for taking care of some neurologic conditions, all kind of cybernetic devices. The more it goes, and the more the cybernetic devices will become um, smart, advanced, and will more look like computers, small computers with operating system embedded in the, in, in, inside them. So if, if they are computers, they are vulnerable to viruses. As a matter of fact, a researcher in 2010 in, the, uh, in a university in Scotland, I think, as a proof of concept, uh, he, he had a RFID chip implanted under its skin in his hand. He would use it to authenticate at different locations in the university or with his phone or whatever. As a proof of concept, he implanted a virus in the RFID chip that infected the RFID readers. Granted, this is not new because RFID viruses have been known for years. But the stance of this guy actually does prove a point, is that a virus can hop from a new man to a computer. And in that, in that case, it's not really the computer virus or the biological virus that evolved to cross the border. It's more like the, the definition of the biological realm that evolved, or at least definition of a living organism within the biological realm, which makes it possible. Now, if you really want to cross the frontier, here's some interesting uh, uh, food for thought. We've seen that in 2002 some scientists could uh, synthesize the polio virus. In 2010, another team of scientists led by, by Craig Venter could synthesize a world bacteria out of nothing in a lab. 
Beyond this, daily genes are modified, created, synthesized, and injected into living organisms for different applications. This is called biotechnologies. For, for uh, industrial applications, to uh, produce drugs, uh, for, agriculture, for agriculture, and other applications. Now, all these genes, the sequence that makes those genes, they are stored somewhere. They are stored somewhere on a computer, or on computers, on databases and computers. So what if a computer virus infects that computer, takes control of the database, injects its own sequence, DNA sequence, inside? Then you get the lab starting to produce this, the injected sequence, possibly at industrial scale. And then you get the virus that hop from the computer to the biological world. Yeah? Conversely, if you want to hop from the biological world into the computer world, same thing. All the labs in the world that map the genomes of living beings, of viruses, of bacteria, once they analyzed the sequence of nucleotides, where do they store them? In computers, in databases. You have some software taking as inputs the sequence that they found out, right? And of course, software may be vulnerable. Just imagine a software that is dedicated to a process um, the genomes, the genetic material of a certain type of biological virus. Very restricted type, like only the flu, for example. So it expects 20 kilobytes, uh, it expects DNA strands 20 kilobytes long. And what if you create, synthesize a virus in a lab with the same envelope as the flu? to with a length, a DNA strand which is twice longer, and the software doesn't do uh, input sanitization, doesn't check for the length. Then when, when, when the, the software will start to sequence your virus, the genetic material of your, your virus, you will create a stack overflow condition. You can redirect the execution flow somewhere into, some, into the database, into the, your own DNA sequence that code for a virus a computer virus, or just download the computer virus, and then you hop from the biological world into the computer world that way. That's, this sounds like science fiction, but it's quite interesting. And actually, there would be, um, there would be some motivations to do that. You may want, as, 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 for example, as a terrorist group or whatever, you may want to access database, databases uh, um, containing genomes, containing um, genetic material. You may want to do that traditionally, like, like attacking, attacking the computers, like sending computer viruses, Trojan horse or whatever. Or just you might just do just what I just, just explained. Release a virus of your own that will infect the database when it's being sequenced, take control of the database, inject its own sequence into the industrial genes, and that way the virus will be produced in industrially speaking, like, like injected in, in all the, corn, the pieces of cones, seeds of cones, or whatever. This is an interesting scenario. What we do up there is not going to happen, at least not, not anytime soon. And yeah, this concludes our presentation. This is a, a, a little drawing by Axel, actually. Uh, you can mail, mail her and she, she says it's a crocodile, I say it's a frog, so you can mail her and tell them what, what you think of her drawing. Um, so if you guys have any question, yeah? Did you see a movie uh, called uh, Matrix? Yeah? Yes. About Matrix? Uh, in relation to what? Huh? 
But they, they don't use the uh, viruses in metrics, right? I'm not sure what your question is. Uh... Okay, 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 okay. It's a good movie. I like Neo. <laughs> and I like the white rabbit. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a, in Matrix, they, yeah, they live in a, in a different reality, uh, in a virtual reality or something. Different. Yes? I know they're, they're already aware. They're already aware. Yeah. So the, it's a preset. It's a preset. Okay. At, at, the, at, at one given moment, yeah. you don't have all the possible, you don't have all the possibilities in your body. Okay. You only have 10 power 8 possibilities over the 10 power 16 uh, uh, possibilities. But as they die, some new ones are generated with different, different receptors. So after a while, all the possibilities get covered. It, it takes a matter, it's a couple of weeks for that. Yes? I don't think there's a very nice conversation between biological and computer virus. Uh, have you ever seen any false positives on the virus side? To my knowledge, no. At least, uh, unless you mean, uh, okay. You know false positives? Yeah, 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 I understand what you mean. Yeah, it can happen in the body. It's called uh, autoimmune, autoimmune uh, disease. It's when, basically, when the NK cells believe that, that some self cells are, are non-self. It's a kind of false positive, and then they start to destroy them. But that's probably the immune system itself. Yeah. 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 It's not really a false positive in the sense that it's a false. It's in the normal scenario, I don't know if the normal, someone would have to say a false positive in the sense. Yeah, I see what you mean. Sorry, right. I cannot hear you very well. Do, do you have a microphone somewhere? Wait, wait. Sorry, I can't hear you. You better give the microphone to the person who said it. I was just trying to relate to you. Uh, and it, oh, okay, so the way I understood it is that after some certain diseases, especially the ones that are attacking muscle, it is possible to develop a condition that would give a rise to autoimmune disease. Well, I, I don't know. It's a, a bit too. Um to specific point to answer, so to answer that one. But I guess why not? I don't know. Any other question? Yes? Why is it uh, It's because there is a... Um, right, it's a very interesting question. Um, my understanding is that um, the shape of viruses it's not infinite. You don't have an infinite number of possibilities because of the, of the length of the DNA that code for proteins. That is my understanding. And also because, uh, as, we, as we've seen with the innate subsystem, uh, viruses and bacteria must have some critical characteristics that, that are evolutionary conserved that you cannot eliminate with evolution because otherwise you, you, you would not be a virus at all. You would, not be able to evolve. For, 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 for bacteria, for example, it's the presence of um, uh, flagella you know, on, on the surface of the bacteria so that they can move with chemotaxis. This is critical. If you don't have them, you cannot move as a bacteria. Both, in my understanding. Mm. 
That is a good question. I do not know. Uh, I see you. You have evil thoughts? <laughs> Yeah, I, I would say it's a yes. It's limited. Yeah. But maybe we could change the RNA or DNA in some way and make the string longer. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's, it, 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 would, it would be an interesting research uh, from an immunology point of view, but uh, raising some ethical issues, I guess. Any other question? Okay, then, thank you.